network before. It's one of the few places you can get really good analysis. Um, so we're going to show a video here, an 18-minute interview with Daniel Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers man, and he's going to talk about Afghanistan and its correlation with the Pentagon Papers. So here we go. Pay a good attention to this one. Welcome to the Real News Network, coming today from Washington, D.C. In 1971, Daniel Ellsberg released the Pentagon Papers. They helped contribute to disillusionment by Americans in the Vietnam War, a contributing factor to the end of the war and the rise of the anti-war movement in the United States. Today, Daniel Ellsberg joins us, uh, joins us on the Real News. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. So you're a legendary figure in, in modern American history. Uh, well, if you talk about people that stuck their neck out, uh, you're one of the people that stuck their neck out most to most effect. Uh, the, your experiences in Vietnam, the, what you knew of the whole uh, counterinsurgency planning and, and efforts, uh, tie that together with, with what's going on in Afghanistan. My experience in Vietnam, two years, going to 38 of the 43 provinces in Vietnam over a period of two years, looking at pacification, uh, writing doctrine for pacification, actually, for uh, what's now called counterinsurgency, taught me that we were not going to succeed in Vietnam, not by what we were doing, and really eventually I realized not by anything that anyone had proposed. There was no prospect for victory in Vietnam, only endless bloody stalemate that was likely to escalate as it did not only under Johnson but under Nixon as well in the air. And why? Uh, I mean, some for the same say the reason it was in Afghanistan. Let me repeat the same words, just change the place names. That's what I could do with the papers I wrote 30 years ago, and they would apply now. No victory lies ahead in Afghanistan. No success of any sort uh, that will be lasting once American troops leave. American troops short of hundreds of thousands will not achieve anything that can be called success in Afghanistan. And I'm sure, by the way, that President Obama is being told that, just as President Johnson was and President Nixon. The notion, I don't believe that there's one official, uh, uh, like my former colleagues in the Pentagon, one official in Washington or in Afghanistan who believes that 40,000 additional troops, which is the minimum request by General McChrystal, will achieve any kind of success in Afghanistan or will be enough. I don't believe there's one official, civil or military, who believes that 80,000 more troops will achieve any kind of success. Nothing short of hundreds of thousands of combined Afghanistan and American troops would, even in their own terms, uh, by their own calculations be successful. I believe they're wrong about that too. But by the way, they're not going to get effective operation out of the Afghan troops any more, uh, any, uh, from any number of more years. We've been training them for eight years. Eight more years, 80 more years will not provide foreign troops the motivation to fight offensively against their own countrymen against the independence of their own country for a foreign power. And we are a foreign power in Afghanistan. That might seem like a truism, but it's very hard for Americans to uh, really internalize the meaning uh, of that. Isn't there a ba uh, an important difference, though, between Afghanistan well, and Vietnam? But, but one very important, which is I was in Afghanistan in the spring of 2002. I, was, I made a film there. I was there for about five or six weeks from one end of the country to the other. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, people hated the Taliban. Um, it's, it's not different than in Vietnam. The Vietnam, uh, the Viet Cong, the Vietnam Communist Party had a, quite a popular position there. Uh, the Taliban yes, doesn't know. have that. In the Afghanistan. Viet Cong, the Viet Cong were respected above all as having beaten the French before us, just as the Taliban or their forerunners <clears throat> are respected for having uh, beaten the Soviets. But the difference here, the difference is not as great as you may think. There was never majority support for the Viet Cong, led by the communists, being the rulers of Vietnam. If people had a genuinely free election there, which of course never occurred, 
they would have had perhaps 10, 15, maybe 20 percent support in comparison to Buddhist leaders, sect leaders, Catholics in some cases, another minority. There weren't too many more uh, people actually actively supporting the Viet Cong as their preferred leaders, rulers of Vietnam, than Catholics, maybe 10 or 15 percent. The difference was that they were all united in not wanting to be run either by foreigners, by Americans, or by a regime that was totally dependent on foreigners as the Saigon regime transparently was and as the Kabul regime transparently is. In other words, what united people behind Viet Cong leadership, or I would say, in, I would expect, behind Taliban support, is that they're leading the fight to expel foreigners. That was the essential similarity there, and I think is, that lies behind my predictions of no success. The more troops we put in Vietnam, the more Viet Cong were recruited. And the more troops we put in Afghanistan, the curves show very clearly from 2005 on. The Taliban has come back, having been, as you say, despised and reviled by most of the country. How can it be that they get the degree of support that they do now? One reason only, the number of troops, of U.S. troops that they're fighting. And when we put more U.S. troops in, more drones, more funeral parties and wedding parties that are destroyed by our drones, which is McChrystal's specialty, along with on-the-ground death squads, uh, is what he was managing in uh, Iraq. The more we do that, the more Taliban we will be facing, despite the fact that they won't be any more popular than they were before. Now talk about McChrystal, because McChrystal's uh, <coughs> known, his reputation is built around his counterinsurgency theory, but that's something you worked on as well. McChrystal uh, is not read counterinsurgency theory. I don't know if he read any of the things I wrote 30 years ago, but he, they look very familiar to him from what he's been reading. Uh, when I read his assessment, I could have written it, in fact. I did read it. I did write it 30 years ago with the place names changed for the embassy. I know that doctrine, uh, that horseshit when it comes to situations like this. I learned to be disillusioned with its prospects when run by a foreign power. It might have some power with uh, a regime that was faced with an insurgency where the regime itself is recognized as legitimate by the people and can recruit without simultaneously recruiting for the opposition uh, by its very presence. A regime that plans to stay there, that is of the same religion, the same language, the same color as the people there. For foreigners, it has never, ever worked and it is not going to work for us now. So what do you think are the objectives? Why, why is the U.S. on a course that seems to be McChrystal's course, an increasing of troops? Well, Larry Wilkerson, the former chief of staff of uh, General Powell and he was secretary of state and others, felt then and apparently feels now that the major uh, thing behind U.S. policy here is the need for a pipeline through Afghanistan from the gas and oil fields of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and others. That, I'm sure, is not the major thing in the minds of the military. It seems as though many of them want to refight the Vietnam War and do it right this time and show that they're not doomed to failure against these uh, ill-armed, uh, ill-uniformed peasants uh, that they're facing, that surely they can do better. They want to do it better this time. Uh, they're going to, it's an understandable motive, they're going to fail. Uh, the French, by the way, went from uh, Indochina where they failed to Algeria determined to do better. And to some degree they did. Uh, they used torture very effectively in Algiers and that so turned the population against them that in the end de Gaulle had to pull them out. The same here, uh, McChrystal's troops in, in Iraq, one of his units was strongly condemned for the torture they were using there. He says that was aberrational. We'll see. I think what he mainly was doing was managing death squads throughout Iraq in his Joint Strategic Operation, Special Operations Command, and I'm sure that's what he has in mind now. And in the short run, that can be effective in clearing a particular unit, like clearing Algiers, except uh, of uh, your opponents, except that it creates so many people who hate you, who are determined to wreak revenge and to expel these murderers and torturers from their homeland, that uh, the situation does not mean that you'll be driven out militarily. It means that the idea of beating the resistance is simply absolutely beyond, uh, beyond hope. When you released the Pentagon Papers, when you leaked the Pentagon Papers, 
uh, it was a media culture that didn't really want to hear what you had to leak. And uh, if I remember correctly, it took some effort to get it to get no, it out. No, 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 that's not the case. The, uh, in fact, the New York Times uh, set out right away as soon as they had the documents to work very hard and put it out. And contrary to what you're saying, mm -hmm. uh, after they were told when the New York Times came out that the, any page of this being top secret was hurting American security and